she first put the keys out and I, one of the other conferences, I think, out in Texas, and some people picked them up, and they said, these things don't work. And it's because they didn't uncover them or put them in right. You know, some of you heard my joke, but it's like the guy who bought the chainsaw, the brand new chainsaw. He took it home, brought it back, and he said, this thing doesn't work. And the guy said, I don't believe it. Why not? And he pulled the thing and started right up. And the guy said, what's that noise? <laughs> That's kind of like the keys. <laughs> kind of like the keys. So, we're, we're, um, as Pastor Mary Beth said, we're doing probably one session, one session tonight, three tomorrow, with a break in between the first two sessions in the morning, break for lunch, and then in the afternoon, um, we'll do one final session and, and follow the leading of the Lord on that. Then for those of you who don't have a home church, you know, she'll be back here at 10. And I'll uh, be sharing some things related to that. If you have a home church, by all means, bless it with your, with your presence. Because you're important to the kingdom. Amen. Is that good preaching? But, but we're excited, you know. Every time Robert comes, Beverly comes, we feel like there's an elevation. And, and this is not to make them feel good. <laughs> Although I hope they do. <laughs> but there's an elevation of things in the spirit that take place. And that's why, you know, we have to be really ready to receive. Um, there are note sheets out on the welcome table if you want to take notes. Um, of course, it's not an assignment. But if, if you're receiving revelation, I would say take notes. You know, only because that way you can soak in it and... and talk to the Lord about it and so on. So, you know, you can take notes on your phone. We won't think that you're texting somebody if you're taking notes on your phone. But we just want to mention that. So, if the ushers will come up, we're going to take up an offering. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> That's our tithe cheerleader, offering cheerleader. And you say, well, why? She's awful loud. Well, considering the fact she just got a promotion. For Woo! Uh, I'd be cheering too. Yeah, we have envelopes if you need envelopes. If you, if you need an envelope. It checks out to a founding love. We do credit debit. We don't put extra zeros on. Integrity. <laughs> It's good to have fun in church. Oh, I, just, I like being in church. I like having fun. We're like, we're sometimes we're in church and we're like, everybody looks like they sucked on lemon juice. Like, this is the great place to be. So let's reach a hand for Beverly and Robin. Lord, we just bless them with every blessing on earth and in heaven. We bless them in the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray you would pour out upon them from heaven to earth in every dimension. Lord, that you're taking them from glory to glory. And we agree with that. We speak it and declare it, decree it over their life. Glory to glory, glory to glory, glory to glory. We thank you, Lord, that they have seen fit to come to our region to pour in to see the, the church, the ecclesia, the region changed for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Beverly, and we have been friends for about two and a half, three years, going on three years. We were part of the original formation of Global Reformers which is with Robert Henderson and the Revelation of the Courts of Heaven. Um, at that time, there were 30, roughly 30 of us in a, a little kind of tight room. The last time I spoke with Robert, or he mentioned it, I think that number of global reformers in three years is up over 10,000. It's up more than it's up All right. to 20,000 now. 20,000? See, so even now, the numbers are increasing. So Robert said, he said, because some of you, many of you know, we, we do porch things where we help people 
approach God as the, as the righteous judge over our family and so on. And so oh, we've been pretty busy doing course things three and four times a week. And Robert said, that, I talked to him a couple of days ago, he said, oh, by the way, he said, I think I'm going to start doing daily devotions. And he said, and when people signed up, 40,000 people signed up. So he said, get ready. I'm like, yes, yeah, sleep is not going to be an option. <laughs> but, you know, when we signed on with Global Reformers, you know, we signed on with the intent you know, to build the, whatever God is doing in the earth, you know, to build, to support Robert, Beverly, and the lead team, and to just do, to see the kingdom of God advanced. Amen. So we're, we're really excited and honored, really. So, Beverly. So what you see up here, um, there are buckets uh, up on the platform, and I'm not good at explaining it, but we call those the trading floors. The trading floors is when, in a short version, God, God moves on your heart, and you say, you know what, I want to hold on, I want that revelation, I want that in my life in a special way. And when that happens, if you feel come up and, and put an offering in there. That, in essence, you're saying, Lord, like Melchizedek and Abraham in, in Genesis chapter 14. Okay, Melchizedek was the type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Abraham won the battle, he, he gave a tenth to Melchizedek and Melchizedek in turn turned around and blessed him. And there was a, a, a blessing of covenant there, a blessing of mutual honor many things that she's going to, I think, talk about. But that's what the buckets are up there. So if you feel that this is not a plea, and some of you know about the trading floors, but that's what the buckets are, you know, if you feel led to, to trade on the trading floor, then that's what they're for. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's, good that's fine. Can I use this? That's fine. I like to have it in front of me for security. I don't know that I want it. But it makes me feel safe. Well, good evening, everybody. Yeah. Good, good to see you all again. I'm going to put it here. I can feel like a conductor then. How are we all this evening? Quite high up the mountain, and that could just be me, the snowboard. But we were quite high up the 
mountain and I knew you were about to go higher because you had all the, you know when, like if you're going up Everest, you have all this gear and you need like all this stuff and you were dressed in it and you kind of looked at me and you said, all of this stuff? I said, well, you're going up the mountain and you turned and you said to me, you know, I've wanted to do this my whole life. And I said to you, you're about to get it now. Wow. You're about to get it now. I believe, it's over here. I believe that that's a word over the body of Christ. Yeah. Amen. You know, 2018, where the prophets are saying we're standing at the door of 2018. And I believe that the promised land is in front of us. Yeah. And that promised land is the promises that you've carried with you, some of you for years and years and years. And you have not seen those promises. You've seen touches of them. And you've said, Lord, I, you know, I know that you said this, but I, I kind of expected to see more of it. I, I know this wasn't the fullness of it. And the Lord is saying, in this year, if you will step out and begin to do some things, this is the year you're going to begin to see that. So I want to encourage those of you who had those promises for years and years, this is the year. It's the year to step through and to step in. You know, it's the year to step in. And to those of you who are younger, Okay, who maybe you haven't had promises for 20 or 30 years because you weren't born yet. But that's also okay because God is saying it's the time for the promises. It doesn't matter if you haven't had them for 30 years because it's His time and His season. You're going to get to step into some things this year just because it's time. Just because it's time. You know, and I'm taking hold of that. You know, I am taking hold of that. I don't want to wait 50 years for a promise. If God say now, I'll go after it now. Amen. Amen. So this year of 2018 is a really key year. It's time to step in. And I'm going to be sharing probably more about that on Sunday. I'm going to be, you know, more prophetic about that kind of thing. But this weekend, as I was asking the Lord, what is it, you know, which direction do we need to go in? What is going to help the body here the most to equip you for this season? And uh, he spoke, to, he started to speak to me. And so this weekend, tonight and all three sessions tomorrow, I am going to be teaching into the concept of the trading floor and trading because I believe it's something that God has begun to unlock now because it is a key spiritual concept that we need to understand in order to begin to establish the kingdom. Amen. Okay? Amen. You know, you, you know, uh, lots of people, when, I, when the Lord started to speak to me about trading floors, you know, many years ago I started to... Uh, I was introduced to this concept of trading, and I was like, okay, I kind of, well, let me not say I got it. I said, God, I don't know what it is, I don't know what, what I'm meant to be doing here, but I'm doing this all in faith, and I don't really understand it, and that's how it was for many years, and then probably about 18 months ago, two years ago now, the Lord started bringing this back again, and opening it up on a whole new level, and he said to me, Beverly, you have to understand trading. It is a key concept that Jesus even talks about in the New Testament for the extension of the kingdom. And so as priests of the new covenant, we have to understand how to trade. And we have to understand what is that and how does that operate and what's our job on the inside of that. And here's the deal. If, we're, if this is the 2018 and we're going into the promised land, okay, part of being in the promised land is that we are a royal priesthood. We are meant to be kings and priests. And one of the keys for this year is that we're going to have to operate as kings and priests. You're not going to be able to just be one or the other. You're going to have to understand your role as a priest under the order of Melchizedek as a new within the new covenant. And you're going to have to understand how to be a king. Because it's going to take both of those to step into our promised land. You don't get one without the other. Okay? So I'm just I'm telling you that as an introduction because I'm going to really be laying this as a foundation for us through the weekend and then Sunday morning I'm going to wrap it all up bringing it together so we can understand what right now is about and how do we take the steps that we need to take in order to get hold of those promises that God says now is the time. Amen. Amen. So that's good. Right, so we're going to start tonight. Has anybody here any of you ever heard any teaching on trading? Okay, so in one sentence, what do you think it's about? <laughs> I know it's a trick question. You can't do it in one sentence. <laughs> um, trading, for, for those of you, even though those of you who've heard something about it, for who is it kind of a new idea? Yeah? 
for some of you, it's a new idea. You haven't really heard about it before. We don't really know what trading is about. That's okay. That's okay. We're gonna, I'm going to do it step by step uh, so that we can begin to understand it. Is that a good? Yeah. yeah. Right. So, I want you to first of all, I want us to understand that the concept of trading, okay, let me start like this. Trading. When we talk about trading, what do you think about? Stock market, we think about the New York Stock Exchange. What do they do there? They trade. They trade, they trade stocks. What does that mean? How do you trade? Well, you, I offer you this and you say, yes, I'll buy it and I take it back. So we trade on the New York Stock Exchange, but you and I, we trade every day. If I go to the store and I want some milk and I walk in there, can I just walk out with a bottle of milk? No, I have to give the, I have to give the store owner some money. So I'm giving him some money, and he gives me some milk, so we just traded, okay? So trading is about an exchange of things. And if you think about it, every economy on earth is based on trading. Go back into the early civilization, that's how economies began to form, was based on trading. Because initially we all, you know, were hunter-gatherers. And we all had to, you know, I don't know, <coughs> find our own little sheep and kill it and eat it. And, and then one day I had all these sheep and I looked over there and I said, hey, they got some wine, they got some grapes. I'll give you my sheep, you give me that wine. You know, and that was how trading started. And, and economies formed around that. Well, I want you to understand that in the realm of the spirit there is a trading that takes place. And it forms the basis of an economy. And when I was here, I believe the last time I was here, I taught about uh, the house of bricks and the house of living stones. Yes. Any of you were here that remember yes. that? Yes. So there are two houses in the earth, two kingdoms in the earth, two economies in the earth, and both of those economies operate on trading. Mm -hmm. So, with that as a little bit of a background, uh, let's see where in the Bible does it actually talk about trading. Right, so the first place that most people know about is Ezekiel 28. So turn there in your Bibles, if you would. We'll start there. I want you to see where the concept of trading comes from. So Ezekiel 28, it is a prophecy to the king of Tyre, and biblical scholars agree that it's talking, there was a natural king of Tyre, but in this scripture they are talking about Lucifer when he was still in heaven, before he was thrown out of heaven. So if we have a look, uh, I'm in Ezekiel chapter 28, and let's go to verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. You see, here are some clues for us. You were perfect. Okay, you were full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. So the, the king of Tyre who existed in that time, he was not in Eden. So this is talking about something else. Every precious stone was your covering. It goes through all the different stones. I'm not going to go through them. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they may gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you. I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. I'm just going to stop there. So there's a lot of scripture. So now, I'm going to tell you the story in Beverly language. Okay, because by now you all know that I like to tell stories. And I think about what would that actually have looked like. So, this is the picture of Lucifer. And it says he was perfect. That word perfect means whole, complete, according to the original pattern. So God created him beautiful and perfect. And it says that he was the cherub that covers. Now, where have you heard that language before in scripture? About a cherub that covers something. In the Holy of Holies, that's right. In the Ark of the Covenant, okay, there were two cherubs that covered the Ark of the Covenant. And God said, I will meet with you there in the midst of 
the cherubim over the mercy seat. Not so. And we, we all know that that picture of the Holy of Holies was a copy of the real up in heaven. Yes. Okay, yes. that's what yes. Hebrews says. So if that Ark of the Covenant was a copy and there were cherubs that covered were right around the presence of God, then we can establish from Scripture that Lucifer was a cherub who was around the throne of God. Would you agree with me? That's what, that's what Scripture is saying? So he was a cherub who before he fell, he was right at the throne of God. Okay? And it says, what was he doing there? He was walking up and down amidst the fiery stones. That's what it says he was doing. And he did that, walking up and down, trading... Until the day that he was filled with violence within and he sinned. So Lucifer, when he was there in heaven, right at the throne, he was walking up and down on fiery stones doing something called trading. And if we don't read that carefully, we think that the trading was the thing he was doing wrong. But I want us to understand, trading was not, there was not something wrong with trading. It was the way he traded, when he, something was wrong in his heart, yeah. when he traded, that caused him to be thrown out. Yeah. But I want us just to think, what do you think, you see, what was the trading? This is the big question. What was the trading? What was he doing? Well, when I looked at that, I thought, well, what goes on around God's throne? Worship. Worship. So if he was walking up and down trading, it has to have something to do with worship. Because we know worship goes on around his throne. So trading has something to do with worship, because that's what happens around God's throne. So Lucifer's walking up and down on, on, on fiery stones, and he's worshipping, and part of his worship incorporates trading. Interesting concept. Okay? So just hold that there for one moment, because that's what he was doing. Then the scripture says that by the abundance of his trading, it says his heart became filled with violence, and he sinned. Okay? Oh wait, before we say that, I want you to see, it said, where was he when he did this? He was on the mountain of God. What's the mountain of God? We now know, it's Mount Zion. So Lucifer was on Mount Zion, where God's throne was. He was walking up and down on fiery stones, worshipping, and part of the worship included trading. But it says that when he did a lot of trade, he was trading a lot, and it says his heart became filled with violence. That word violence in the Hebrew, in the root form, is unjust gain and unrighteousness. And in its root, it means to turn away from righteousness and justice. So as he was there worshipping and trading, something in his heart started to turn away from righteousness and justice. Turn away from, the, from God. Turn away from what was good and right. Because remember, his throne is on righteousness and justice. So something in his heart started to turn him away from that. And when his heart became filled with that unrighteousness, it says, then he sinned. And we know the word sin means to miss the mark. And then it says, he got, God says he cast him out of the holy mountain. Here comes a Beverly opinion. I'm just telling you, this is a Beverly opinion. Okay, I reserve the right to change my mind in future. So, so, he was, so something went wrong with his trading that had to do with his heart that was twisted away from God. And when that happens and he sins, God throws him out of the holy mountain. I personally, this is my opinion, I don't believe he got thrown right out of heaven. I believe he sinned because it says he got cast off of the mountain. Then I believe what he did, well let me go before I say what he did. It said his heart became filled with violence. So his heart was twisted away from God. So something went wrong in his worship. He was still trading, but his heart wasn't quite in the right place. So Isaiah chapter 14 gives us some insight into what he may have been thinking, what might have gone wrong. Because remember, he's right at God's throne. He's worshipping God. If we go to Isaiah 14 and verse 12, it's talking again about Lucifer. Because it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. So we're talking about the same guys in Ezekiel 26. How you are cut down to the ground, because we know God cut him down. You who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest, farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. 
yet you shall be brought down to Sheol. I want you to see that in that scripture, we can see some stuff going on in Lucifer's heart. Can you not? So he was, be oh, this is what I believe, he was before the throne. He was worshipping, and something in him started to say, hey, I also want to sit up here on this throne. I also want to be worshipped. I think I can do this job as well as you can, God. You know, why can't I also? I want to be just, I want to be like God. So something in his, in, as he was before the throne, something went wrong in his heart. He started to have an issue against God. And his issue against God was that he, he wanted to be like God. Yeah. So with his worship, he may have been doing the outward form of worship, but his heart was saying something else. And God is not stupid. God heard what was in his heart. And God said, no, 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 off this mountain. You're not going to bring defiled worship here with a heart that is not right. Because trading is not the problem. Trading with a wrong heart yes. is the problem. Yes. So he gets, I believe, thrown off the mountain. But he's still in heaven. And so I believe that he now goes on his little, uh, what do we call it, revolution circuit. And he goes to all the angels in heaven and says, hey, you know, I've been there worshipping and I saw how this trading thing worked. We can take over. We can also have thrones like this. We don't have to be doing all this work. We can do it as well as he can. Come on, let's overthrow heaven. Because if you continue reading in that Ezekiel 28, verse 18, when it says, You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. So I believe he got, he first sinned with the wrong heart, he gets thrown off of Mount Zion, then he goes around heaven, whipping up his revolution, because he now wants to take over, and we know one third of the angels agrees to go with him, but God says, no, 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 I'm not having this. Now all of you out. And we know the story that him and one third of the angels are cast out of heaven. And they're cast out to, I don't know where, because I'm not that good a biblical scholar. But they land somewhere. I, you know, I, I, on a lot of these things, there's, there, there's not a lot of definitive answers. Yeah. So I'm just going to say, they're cast out of heaven. Okay? What we do know, what I believe happens, is that we do know Lucifer wants his own kingdom. We do know he wants to be like God. He wants to sit on his own throne. In fact, he wants to sit on that throne in heaven. And he is not giving up. Because he tried to incite the revolution, which failed. He gets thrown out. You'd think any normal person would say, hey, we get it. God's stronger than us. Let's just deal with this. But not Lucifer. He's like routing up the crowd. Well, let's go again, guys. Come on. We can do this, you know. And I believe, because the next place that we, that we see Lucifer is where? In the Garden of Eden. I believe he was cast out to wherever he was cast out. And he re-strategized. Because he didn't give up his plan. He's, he, he was now, and he was mad at God. And he wanted to be like God. And he believed that he could be like God. And, and there are numerous other things that can come into that. But then he sees God create this garden. Eastward in Eden. And he sees him put man in the garden. And he sees him do what? Give man this dominion in the garden. Because here's the thing. If I'm Lucifer and I want to create a kingdom... But everything around me is owned by God and ruled by God and has God's authority over that. How am I going to create a kingdom? How am I going to create a kingdom? I've got nothing. Remember, he can't create anything. He's just there with his one third of the angels all looking at each other. But, but they, can't, they, they, don't even have any, they don't have any territory. They have nothing. Until the day that Lucifer sees, ah, here's some beautiful garden territory. Top, uh, you know, what do you call it? Real Top estate. real estate. It's really great. Oh, and God has given the dominion to these two. Huh. Yep, I can see a plan. Because it says, Genesis 3, it says, Lucifer was the most cunning of all the beasts of the field. Yeah. Now remember, he couldn't just go, he couldn't just, he couldn't just go and take that dominion. Because he understood the laws of the kingdom. He couldn't just take it. God was not going to allow it. God had given it to Adam and Eve. He knew, I'm going to have to trade this away from them. Yeah. Because they, he understood a principle right. that kingdoms are established through trading. He learned that when he was trading in heaven. Which I'm going to explain that a lot more tomorrow. <coughs> he understood that. So he, when he saw the dominion given to Adam and Eve, he said, here is my opportunity. Yeah. 
I just need to trade that dominion away from them. Now we have the beginning of a kingdom. So let's go to Genesis 3 and have a look at the trade that he did. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, desirable, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took up its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband and they both ate. And we know the story. So I want you, I'm going to break that down a little bit for you so you can see the trade that was made. Okay? Because the fall of man was a trade. Lucifer traded for a dominion. And I'm hoping you're beginning to understand he wanted that dominion because why? He wanted to build his own kingdom. He wanted to have his own throne that would rival God's throne. So what does he do? He goes to Eve. Here's Eve in the garden. Pruning. I don't know if she's gardening. I'm not a gardener, people. She's gardening. Whatever you do when you garden. Okay? Try la la la. Life is good. Praise the Lord. La la la. And she hears this voice. And she turns away from her focus on what God has given her to do, on, on, on worshipping God and what she thinks. She turns. And she begins to engage with Lucifer. She starts the conversation. Because he says, well, has God really said? She turns and she says, yes, he has said that. And the minute that she turns her attention away from God and begins to engage with the enemy, she steps, in a sense, onto his trading floor. Now he knows. She's taken her eyes off the purpose and God. She's talking with me. She's open to a trade. Okay? And then... Uh, and she says, no, no, you know, we can't have this, we can't have that. Then, then he says, well, you know, God doesn't want you to. He just doesn't want you to have it because then you'll be like God. What is he doing? Okay? He's offering her a trade. She is already like God. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah. She's already yeah. like yeah. God. Yeah. She's made in his image. She has perfect right. union with him. Yeah. She already has that. She just doesn't really know who she is. That's it. Okay? And so he offers her... What's the only thing Lucifer has to offer us? He only has one thing to offer us. In, in many different forms. But it's one thing. It's called sin. Because remember it says sin was found in him. Iniquity was in him. That's all he has. Is sin and iniquity. And he has to dress that up in the best looking offer he can make you. Because that's all he has. He can't give you anything else. All he could offer her was disobedience. Dressed up very nicely with some deception sewn on the side. Made it look very pretty. Okay? And what did he offer her? Sin. That was the offer. And what did she do? It says afterwards, when she had looked and seen that it was good. So she considered the offer. She was on his trading floor. He made her an offer. And she considered it. She thought about it. And then, what did she do? She took the sin. Okay, it says she ate of, you know, she ate of the fruit, whatever that is, but she disobeyed God. She took sin. And when she took sin, what did he do? He said, well, you've taken something of mine, now I can legally take something of yours. Because it's a trade. You see, the wages of sin is death. If you partake of sin, something must die. It's the law. It's God's law. If you partake of sin, something must die. Scripture, it's clear, that's God's law. And so what happened is something died. Now, she didn't fall down dead, but what we know, that her spirit, they were then cut off from heaven, and then they had to be put out of the garden, and man was now in a situation where he was separated from God. Death was at work in us because of that trade that was made. And I want us to understand that when Satan made that trade, Lucifer, it was then called Satan made that trade, he now had a dominion. He had a starting ground. Because what happened? The government of God set up in the created realm. When Lucifer did that trade, he's the new boss in town. So everybody out of the, your offices, all the angels, and in came all the demons. 
and they all had parties. Woohoo! New officers! You know, office parties! Here I am! I'm the king of this! I'm the king of that! You know, when they change administration, I think it's a lot like that. <laughs> you know, out with the old and in with the new. And that's what happened. There was a change of administration of the government of the earth and of the created realm. And Lucifer now had a dominion, he had a kingdom, he had something to start to build with, and what was his intention? I am going to build a kingdom that will rival the Most High because I am going to get there. I'm going to also sit on the sides of the north. So his plan all along has to be built to, is to build a kingdom, starting from here, build a kingdom that will rise up into the heavens and displace God. That's his plan. What's God's plan? He's in heaven in his kingdom and he's trying to get his kingdom down on earth to displace what's here. So we have a clash of two kingdoms. One's trying to build itself up there and one's trying to get down here. And we are at the forefront of that fight. Because which kingdom are you all working with? Are you helping the enemy build his up? Or are you helping God bring his down? You, you're in one or the other. There is no in between in this thing. So you have to know which kingdom are you serving in? Which kingdom are you training in? Because both of those kingdoms extend through trade. Okay? So I want us to understand this. Every time that you sin, in your past ever, every time that you chose to sin, you chose to take sin, you traded something away. Now you may not have known what got traded away. When Eve took that, whatever it was, when she sinned, she didn't know she was going to lose the dominion of earth. Satan doesn't play fair. He didn't say, okay, I'm going to give you this and you're going to give me the dominion. She would have said, no, dude, are you crazy? You know? <laughs> Satan doesn't play like that. He offers you sin. And you're tempted in that moment. Okay? And you're not thinking about what you could possibly lose. Because here's the deal with Satan. He doesn't necessarily take it right then and there. He sometimes takes something. Maybe there was an opportunity that God was opening up to you. You didn't know about it. And that he took it away before you even knew it was coming. Maybe he took something from you that only years down the line you were going to see that it actually happened. I want you to see the scripture in James. James chapter 1. <coughs> James chapter 1. You see, what I'm talking about now, I call this, uh, because Satan is always trying to trade things away from us. Remember, he cannot create anything. So in order to build his kingdom, he has to trade stuff away from you and I to build his kingdom with. He doesn't have resources. He doesn't have people. He doesn't have finances. He doesn't have revelation. He doesn't, he doesn't have anything. So he's got to trade it away from us to build his kingdom with it. Or to trade it away from us to create a copy of it so that he can use it in his kingdom and we don't get to use it in God's kingdom. So he is always, and especially Christians, because they are connected to God. They, 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 their pipeline, for want of a better word, to heaven is open. There's a flow of life from heaven to earth. We're, in the, we're, we're meant to be receiving all of the stuff from heaven to do what we're called to do. And so he just sidetracks it. He keeps getting us to sin. And he just siphons off everything that God was sending down for you. He just keeps getting siphoned off to build his kingdom. That should make you mad. It made me mad when I realized, I was like, they're building with my stuff? Are you kidding me? Like, I want it back. And, and, I, and so he's always looking to trade with us. And I'd say there's unintentional trading and intentional trading with Satan. And unintentional trading is this temptation part of it. So I want us to see this in James chapter 1. And let's go to verse 13. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. That's quite clear. God doesn't tempt you. God does not tempt you. It is the enemy who tempts you. Okay? Verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Okay, I want you to remember Eve. She was doing what she was doing. She was drawn away. The enemy knows how to draw you away. When you are focused on God and you're going after him, he knows just what to put in the corner of your eye to catch your attention and draw you away from your passion. You know? You all know me. 
You know, I'm on this health and fitness kick. Not a kick, I'm changing my lifestyle. I'm changing my lifestyle, I'm changing my mind. But, you know, we're going like this, and the enemy knows. I just need to see this little cheesecake over here. I was in New York, for goodness gracious, a New York cheesecake. And I was like, oh, even my daughter said, she says, Mom, you're in New York. I'm like, I know, but I'm going to be strong. You know, the enemy knows just what, what, what it is for you that will tempt you. He knows what's the lust of your flesh. And he puts it just over here to see, can he get you to take your eyes off of the prize, Jesus, the thing you're going after, and can he entice you away to come and have a look a little closer at that cheesecake? Okay, or whatever that is for you. So, so each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. We take our eyes and our focus off of what God is saying, and we are drawn away by the lust of our flesh or our own desires, okay? And as we do that, we're being pulled onto a trading floor. We're being tempted. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So I look at the cake. Sure, it's a New York cheesecake. Oh my word, I might die if I don't have that today. You know what I'm saying? Our desires for, the, for whatever the thing is that has drawn us away, it could be anything. For each of us, we each have our own different things that are desires that draw us away. And when we begin to look at that, it says when desire has conceived, which means when it, you know, you know what it means to conceive, okay? When it conceives... It gives birth to sin. Because when I look at it, and my eyes are like, oh, I have to have this, I make a decision with my will in that moment, and I say, I'm going to eat this thing. I'm going to do this sin. I'm going to take advantage of that. I'm going to steal the money. I'm going to lie. I'm going to, whatever it is, it's sin. And in that moment, when it conceives, when my will is, is added to it to say yes, it conceives, and it says gives birth to sin. And when I eat of, so I'm going to eat of that sin, it says, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Sin doesn't immediately bring forth death. If I eat that cheesecake today, okay, I'm not going to feel the effects of it necessarily tomorrow. But I'm going to feel the effects of it in my body, okay? Because sin, when it is full blown, brings forth death. If I, if I cannot say no to cheesecake and I'm going to eat it every single day, Baby, I am going to have a problem down the line, okay, with, with issues of my health. And I'm using a very simple example, but think about any type of sin. Sin, when it is full grown, it gives birth to death. And that's why sometimes in the moment when we're tempted to sin, we go, oh, it's just such a small little thing. Really, it's not really going to make a difference. Like, who will ever know? Or really, it's not a big deal. Here's what James is saying. Understand, you might think it's not a big deal, but it is sin and a trade is happening. <coughs> so you are taking sin and the enemy is taking life from you. Now that life could be immediate, that life could be 10 years down the road, but life, you can be sure that in some area of your life death is coming. Because you traded and the wages of sin are death. Okay? So every time we have sinned, we lost something. We don't even know what we lost. And this is why I think so many of us as believers are struggling. And we're like, God, we can't get breakthroughs. And we're pushing and we're doing everything we know how to do. And we probably are not living in active sin and probably haven't for years. But you just can't get breakthrough. You can't see what you know you should be living in. Because a lot of your life and your breakthrough and everything you're meant to, be had, meant to have had has been traded away. Maybe by you when you were younger. Definitely by your generations before you. So not even just you. Think about your generations before you. What have they traded away? Because every time we sin, a trade happened. And we lost something. That's quite hectic. Yeah. <laughs> That's where I look at it. I'm like, oh my goodness. God intended for us to be much fuller. God intended to us, for us to have so many things in our hands, able to live life and do the things we're meant to do, but because of sin, it's been traded away. Like, that, that, when I began to realize that, I was like, oh God, help us. Help us. We have not understood the magnitude of sin. Because often, you know, once, when we, once we're born again and we have a revelation about it, we kind of go, yeah, it's wrong, but we can repent and it will be fine. Okay? We can repent and the blood of Jesus will thank God for the blood of Jesus and for the cross. Because that is 
the only way that our sin can be forgiven. But here's the thing. Often our sin is forgiven, but we don't go ask back for what was taken. Yeah. And do you think the enemy is just going to say, oh, they repented, let's give them back what we took? You think he's just going to do that? No way. So we just think, oh, well, our sin and our repentance, and so we repent, and we are forgiven, and the blood has removed that sin, but the enemy is still holding your stuff. Because he says, well, they never asked for it back. Well, we didn't know it was taken. Can you see? So the enemy could be holding on a whole lot of your stuff that you don't even know that was gone. <laughs> He's got stuff you didn't even know was yours. And so part of understanding trading, and, and, and what I'm doing tonight is I'm laying a foundation, understanding the demonic, what I call demonic trading flaws, uh, because it's easy for us to understand. We've all been there. We've all been on them. Okay, And we can see how through sin, when we sin, the enemy takes something from us. So are you all seeing that? Yes. Okay, that's quite clear. So you understand how that works. Alright, well I want, I want us just, I'm going to take a little interlude here. We must understand that the blood of Jesus and the work of the cross was yes. the greatest trade ever made. Amen. When Jesus hung on yes. that cross, he paid for all our sins, but at the same time he said, I now, through taking their sin on me, every trade that was ever yes. made for all time can be annulled when they appropriate this Amen. victory, and you can now have it back. Amen. So you see, once we repent, when we accept Jesus, and when we that's why going into the courts is so important, because when we go in and appropriate this victory, we now have a legal basis to say, hey, and everything that was ever taken from me through this sin, I've repented, the blood has washed it away, now bring it back. I want it all back. I want back all the land that was lost. I want back all the connections that were lost, the revelation that was lost, uh, the, you know, the businesses that were lost, all the stuff that was lost. You now no longer have a right to hold it, Satan, so bring it back. So now we lay claims to bring things back, but we're doing it from a legal point of view because we say, you no longer have a right. I understand that the only reason you have these things is because of the sin. The sin and the iniquity has now been removed in the courts. We've, we have applied the blood of Jesus. We have appropriated the victory of the cross. And now I'm laying my claim. I want my stuff back. Yeah, yeah. I want my stuff back. And you can't begin to hold it anymore. And so, so that's why learning how to go into the courts is very important. Because it is through the courts, through that legal procedure, that you claim back what was lost <coughs> through the trades that you made. Now I want to just touch on one other thing. So, in, in terms of demonic trading flaws. So I explained a little bit unintentional trading. Like temptation for me is unintentional trading. You didn't mean to go and trade with the enemy. You got tempted into it. Okay? And let me just say this on, 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 on temptation. You know, even Jesus was tempted. We know Jesus was tempted. And I believe, you know, when it says that we know he was in the desert, and for example, the one where he takes him up on a high mountain, and Satan shows him all the kingdoms of this world, and he says, these all belong to me. Jesus doesn't argue with him. Because Jesus knows, yes, you traded these away from Eve. I know all these kingdoms belong to you. And so... Satan says to him, if you will bow down and worship me. So Jesus was on that trading floor. And he was because he was being tempted. We know that. Why? Because Hebrew says, our high priest who was tempted in every way, just as we are. So Jesus was tempted. Jesus was drawn onto the, tra onto the trading floor. So stepping onto the trading floor is not a sin. We can all be tempted. Even Jesus was. But it's what he did. Because Satan said to him, if you will fall down and worship me, then I will give you these, I'll give you these kingdoms. And I, in Beverly fashion, like to think that Jesus maybe thought about it. Because he was tempted. Because what was he being offered? He was being offered a shortcut. He knew he was going to have all of these given to him anyway. But here was the enemy offering him a shortcut. You don't have to go through the cross. You don't have to go through all that suffering. I'll just give it to you right now. Now, how many of you and I wouldn't accept a shortcut? <laughs> Listen, we all want shortcuts. We all, none of us want to go through process. None of us want to go through pain. We all want the, the, quick, the quick fix. So we all would have probably taken that, taken that temptation. But not Jesus. What does he say? He says, it is said you will worship no other gods beside me. 
he understood that Lucifer was trying to get him to trade, and he understood that trade was about worship. And he said, wow. I will not worship you. I will not trade with you. I know what I'm doing. And he stepped off of that trading floor, and it says that, it says that Satan left him. Satan left him. Okay? So we can be tempted. Because the enemy is going to try and get you to worship him and not God. Because what do you do? Here's the deal. When sin is offered to you, why do you accept it? Because something in your heart goes, well, you know, it's not so bad if I do this. It's not so bad. No, 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 no. And so what? It doesn't really matter. Is it going to make all the... But what are you doing? There is a rebellion in your heart <laughs> rising against God's ways. And you choose, you say, yes, I'll take sin. What are you doing? Your heart is turning away from God and saying, I'd rather do it this way. That's worship. That's worship. Okay? So I wanted you, I wanted you to see that. So Jesus, here's the thing. Stepping onto the trading floor when you're tempted, if you step on, that's not the sin. It's when it conceives, when you put your will into and say, yes, I'm going to take it. That's when you trade. Okay? Because we're all going to be tempted. Scripture says the enemy will tempt us. And we need to, in that moment, say, no, I'm not worshipping you. I'm stepping off here because I have chosen who I will worship. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to worship any other gods. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to trade with you. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's unintentional trading. Mm -hmm. Now, there is such a thing as intentional trading. Okay? This is a little easier to kind of get. Uh, mostly because... Let me, put it, let me put the easy example. In past generations, when it wasn't you and me, in past generations, and we, I've taught some of this here before, you know, back in the olden days when we all lived in Europe as tribes, okay, or we were still tribal from wherever we came from, every village that there was had a god that it served. So they would have a big old wooden statue or stone statue or whatever it was in the center of the village, and everybody served that god. So when they wanted rain, they would bring offerings. They would bring offerings to their God and lay it down. When they wanted to have children, they would bring fertility offerings. If they were going to war, they had to bring offerings. This was their God that they worshipped. Now what were they doing? Okay, This God, this big edifice, whatever it was, was generally at an altar. Okay, And what were they doing? They took something that they had. And they went to their God and they said, here, we give you this because we want this from you. They traded. They were just trading with something in the realm of the spirit. Okay? It was a concrete whatever it was. But they understood this represents a God. So they were trading in the realm of the spirit. So they were bringing physical things and saying, I'm bringing this to you and now I want you to do that for me. So they were trading. And this is what I call intentional trading. Now, we all know the gods represented behind those gods are demons. Okay? So they were intentionally trading with demons. They were going to demons and saying, I'm bringing you this and I want, and I want to receive that. That's called intentional trading. Okay? And when you intentionally trade, so they would come and they would bring an offering to say, this is what I want from you. Then he would give something to them, but invariably when he did that, okay, there would be a covenant or a contract tied into that. So say, for example, we're going to war against village B down the road here. So we want to beat village B down the road. So what are we going to do? We're going to say, okay, we're coming to you. We, know we need to bring a big sacrifice because village B, those guys are big and stronger than us. And so we need to bring a big sacrifice because in the demonic realm, they know the more power you want released out of the spirit realm, the greater the offering you have to bring. Okay? Or the purer the offering you have to bring. So, for example, they would want to bring virgins because they were pure and released more power in the realm of the spirit. You have to bring a human sacrifice as a greater sacrifice than a chicken or some milk. Okay? These are in the demonic realm. You speak to anyone in the occult, they'll tell you these things. It's well known. The greater the sacrifice, the greater the power that will be released. So, now they want to go to war over village B over here. So what they do is they come and they say, okay, we know we have a big war to fight here. So this is what we're going to do. God of war, whatever you are. We are going to dedicate to you all the firstborn children in our tribe. We give them to you. Basically, their books of life, their destiny, their who they are. We will trade them to you. 
if you will give us victory. And this is a, we, we're so serious about this. Here, we will all bring our physical firstborns right now, and we will make a sacrifice of them and shed their blood. So this is a blood covenant between us with this physical blood to ratify the covenant we're making in the spirit. Okay? And they would go to war. And that, that sacrifice would release power, and these two things would fight, and whether they won or didn't won, did, won or didn't won, won or, or not, <laughs> The covenant that was made remains. Yeah, right, okay? right, now that's right. back in Germany in the Vikings days, whatever, you have tried. Now here you are, Susie, living in Albany right now. And you know what? You're, you know, your son, your firstborn, and you know this boy, he's just always getting in with the wrong crowd. Every time we think we've got him on the straight, he just, something like the bottom falls out. We just can't seem to break through with this, with our son. We love him. We know he want, he's a good kid at heart, but it's like we just, it's like bad things keep happening and he just ends up doing the wrong things and then he's in the wrong place at the wrong time and mixed up with the wrong people and we just don't know what to do anymore. Well, here's the deal. He's a firstborn in a line that came back from that time several thousand years ago. And the enemy is saying, well, this kid belongs to me because he was dedicated to me. So he's trying to walk after God, and the enemy is pulling him and saying, no, 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 your life belongs to me. So the enemy has his book of life, his destiny is being held in the hands of the enemy. And so the more he tries to walk towards God, the more legal right the enemy brings against him. And the court says, no, this, this kid belongs to me. He's got to come this way. He's got to come this way because he's owned. When he was born, the enemy already owned him. And many of us today are struggling under those types of covenants and curses because we were traded away thousands of years ago. Okay? And that's why we've got to get into the courts because, again, the blood of Jesus, the work of the cross, dealt with that covenant, dealt with that contract. We have to get into the court and we have to deal with it. We have to annul that covenant because it was annulled at the cross. Colossians 2.14 tells us that. But we have to get in there and say, I understand that we were part of that covenant. We repent for entering into that covenant. We repent for offering our firstborn. We repent for trading our children on this altar. See, that's intentional trading. Now, that's nice and easy to look at because it's always, you know, those people long ago and far away. But we intentionally trade sometimes and we... We, we unintentionally, intentionally trade, if you get that, okay? Um, you know, for example, we trade our children, we trade our friends sometimes at altars. Think about this. You're a, and I'm not saying this is here in this place, you're a business person. And you, all you're interested in, well, I've got to make that money, I want to get that promotion, I want to get that next thing. It doesn't matter to me what happens to my children in the process. Many of us will sacrifice and trade the lives of our children in order to get other things that we want. We haven't got time for that. The, the, the Lord's taught you, saying, you need to spend time with this child. There's things you need to do. There's things you need to do. Well, God, you know what? I've got to be over here, and I'm going after this thing. And we don't realize we trade them away so that we can go after the thing we want. I'm just saying. I'm not going to go into that too much. Uh, you know, that's there. Other examples of intentional trading that you may not think are intentional trading, and I really don't mean to step on any toes, but I might just. <laughs> I have realized. This is my opinion. You may have a different opinion, but this is my opinion that I've come to see. Gambling. You see, when you go to gamble, what are you doing? You are taking some money, a sacrifice, because it's pink. And where are you going? You're putting it down on a table, Okay? For what? What are you buying in exchange? What are you trading for? A, ch a chance. Okay? But, what's, but what, what's really going on here? Here's the deal. You are taking your money, putting it down on a table for the chance to make it rich quickly. Okay? But why do you want to make it rich quickly? Shortcut. 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 I don't want to go through the process of learning how to steward my money and learning how to do things the way God wants and sowing and reaping. That all takes too long. Man, i got to go on holiday and I need like, I don't know, $10,000 tomorrow. So we got to go to the God of chance and we got to bring him our offering and put it down at his altar.
Santa and hope that he's going to give us something. But here's what the Lord began to show me about that. And he said, what happens? You go and you actually are going, there is a God of chance. Okay? And you're putting your offering at his altar. Okay? You're coming to say, I'm going to trade with you. I'm, I'm bringing my offering because I want to trade with you. I want you to understand, when you bring an offering, you are signaling that you are ready to trade with a God. Okay? So you bring and you put that down, and now what are you looking for? You're looking to get rich quick. Your hope is no longer in the Lord. Your hope for the money that you need to do whatever it is you want to do is now in the God of chance. Even though you, some people tell me that you know, they're trusting the Lord to win the lottery. I'm like, you're not trusting the Lord. Your trust is not in the Lord. Your hope is not in the Lord anymore. Your hope is in the God of chance. Because you bought him off and he says, my hope is in you. And, and when you put that down and you're watching that little ball spin around that roulette table and everything's in you is going, yes, land on black 25, land on black 25. Your hope is in that God. And in that moment when you're there, he begins to take your hope in the Lord away from you. You exchange your hope in the Lord for a hope in the God of chance. I want to show you that. It says in Hebrews... You just find that scripture in Hebrews. Hmm, I should have written the scripture down. This is it. Um, okay, so it's Hebrews 6 and verse 15. Oh no, let's go to verse 12. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. See, he says here, through faith and patience you inherit the promises. Okay? We're not meant to go to the God of chance. Through faith and patience we inherit the promises. And then it goes, you know, I'm just going to skip over the next two verses. It's talking about all of how God swore an oath uh, and about his counsel. Uh, verse 18. That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. That hope set before us, verse 19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. What he's saying, if you read through this whole scripture, he's saying, through faith and patience, you're going to inherit everything I have for you. But you, are, you need the hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has said he will do all of these things. He will do them for you. Our hope has to be firmly cemented in him that it's he who will bring us through. That hope is the anchor for your soul. When you get upset, when you get worried, am I going to pay the rent? Can we do this? Is God going to bring me through? The hope in the Lord Jesus is meant to anchor your soul into the Holy of Holies. And when you're being tossed around, it's meant to pull you and your soul into that place to say, I am with you. I will bring you through. Trust in me. You don't need to go anywhere else. That's what brings us through. It's what holds us into Him. That we see the victory through faith and faith and patience. Amen. But when we gamble, that hope, we say, I won't hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. I put that, I'll trade that away. I'm, what happens is I go to the God of chance with my offering. He says, oh, you're hoping in me. I'll give you hope, but I'm taking your hope. So now the next time when something goes wrong, you go, I used to have faith to trust the Lord, but I just can't anymore. Now you're going here. Now, now it's not only gambling. I have seen people that start with gambling. They get pulled into every get-rich-quick scheme going. Every Ponzi scheme. Every, dare I say, Iraqi dinar. You know, every, every last thing that's out there, they will get pulled into it. Why? Because their hope has been traded away. Their hope is not in the Lord. Their hope is in the God of chance that they will not have to go through process. You see, we don't understand the wiles of the enemy. And so we're constantly stepping onto his trading floor, and we're trading with him, and he is taking the very precious things that God has for us that will see us through and give us victory. They are being traded away from us. 
And so we're ending up going, God, we're struggling, we can't make this through, we're not getting answers, we don't know what's going on. It's because we've traded away the things that God gave us to actually get through these places. And so here's the deal, guys. We've got to stop trading with the enemy. It's time to say, enough. I am not trading with him anymore. Because remember, every time you trade with him and he takes something from you, he takes your hope and he takes the things God assigned to you and he builds his own kingdom with them. Yeah. Yeah. And his kingdom is getting, look around you, his kingdom's yeah. quite well established yeah. Yeah. on your stuff. Yeah. On your stuff. Okay? So it's time, number one, for us to stop trading with the enemy. We've got to become, we've got to recognize this and say, hey, I'm not going to be pulled into these things anymore. I'm not going to intentionally trade away my hope in the Lord and my things in the Lord. I'm not doing that anymore. Because I understand that God is the one who is supplying all my needs, not only physical, everything I need to fulfill what He has called and given me to do. He is going to make it available to me. He is not holding back anything from you. He, everything that you need for life and godliness is yours. Amen. In Christ Jesus. Amen. Okay? Now the enemy has taken some of it from you. But God said, I sent my son. The work at the cross was a complete and whole work. You have to just appropriate that and you can get back everything that was stolen. Amen. You see, you can't lose with God. You cannot lose. The enemy just likes to make you think you can lose. He likes to make you think God's holding and keeping stuff away from you. He is not. He's saying, I've given you everything. And then when you traded it away, well, here's the blood of Jesus. Here's the work of the cross. Use that. There is nothing he can hold away from you any longer. God wants you to be victorious. God wants you to break through. God wants you to have those promises that he said are for you this year. He wants you to have them. Yeah. everything you need to get hold of them. We just need to wake up and throw off some of these veils and say, okay, I get it. I get it. I'm not going to trade with the enemy anymore, but I am going to learn and understand how to do this. I'm going to repent. I'm going to go to court. I'm going to claim back what was lost. And I'm going to stop trading with the enemy because I don't want to be in his kingdom. I don't want to be building his economy. Okay? Every time we trade, we're in his economy. I want to come out from that. Now, Lord, teach me about your trading. Yes. Lord, teach me how do I trade in your house. Yes. Teach me about your economy. Okay? And that's what we're going to get into tomorrow. So, because tonight, I wanted us to understand, because it's so sad, but we understand the things of the enemy much better than we understand the things of the kingdom. And so I'm hoping tonight that you've got a clear picture of what it looks like to trade with the enemy. Okay? And I'm hoping in your heart you've made a decision. We're not doing that anymore. We're not doing that anymore. And and we're going to be, you know, part in your understanding of the courts, which I know you guys are really well trained in. Uh, in the in your training in the courts, uh, you probably already do it, but to be more intentional about claiming back what was lost. Yes. Claiming back what was lost. That's why when you're in your court cases and you're dealing with stuff and you've been through all the repentance, what we always begin to say is, we give back everything that the enemy gave us. Because yes. you don't want the enemy stuff. Right. You don't want the little bit of, maybe it's riches, maybe it's infants, maybe it's whatever you traded for. Because remember, when the intentional trades were made, you traded for something, for provision, for fertility, for protection, for whatever it is. And you got it. So now you have to give it back and say, I don't want protection from the enemy. I don't want anything that he has to give me. I don't want it. I give it all back. Any influence I have, any authority I have, any, any wisdom, anything I got from him, I give it back. I don't want it. What I want is what Jesus wrote for me. Yeah. And now I'm laying a claim for everything that is for me and for my generations. Well, here I am to say, I recognize it was taken from us. We've repented. Yes. The, sin of, the, the sin has been washed away through Jesus. And here I am. I'm alive. I'm carrying the DNA. I want it all back. Yeah. I want it back. Okay? Because it is time to get it back. Because yes. if you're going to step into 2018 and do what you need to do, I think
think you need some resources. Yes. I think you need some opportunities. I think you need some connections you've never had before. You need some relationships you've never had before. You need some things you haven't had before, but it's not that God didn't want you to have them. They are yours, but someone else has been holding them. It's time for it to come back. It's time for it to come back. So, Father God, as we just finish out tonight, I don't want to be too long tonight. Father, as we finish out tonight, Lord, I'm just aware, even as we're standing here, that for many people here, Lord, they have repented of things in their life. And they have been faithful to repent and faithful to blot out the sin. But Father, tonight we want to come before you as the righteous judge. And we want to ask, Father, that all of those things that have been traded away from us, those things which the enemy is holding that belong to us and to our families, Father, to our churches, to our businesses, Father God, even to our regions. Lord, we are here today, Father, for all that stuff that we already repented of. And Lord, you've removed that from us. We are here to say we want back what was taken in the trade. Lord, we want it back. We lay a claim with you tonight. We understand that you are a good God. That you have given us everything we need for righteousness and godliness. Lord, everything we have need of to step into 2018. We understand that you have provided it. And tonight we lay a claim for everything that needs to come back to us in the name of Jesus. Lord, I want to ask for it to be brought back from the enemy's camps, brought yes, back out of his banks, brought yes, back out of every Jesus. place where he is hidden, and every place where it's sitting in his house. Lord, I'm asking tonight, let it be brought back and put before your throne. We want it put back into the hands of Jesus. We want it put back into the hands of Jesus. Yeah, I'm re you know, guys, even as I'm praying that, that's what I'm seeing. It's like I'm seeing that in different parts in the house of the enemy, I see some are like bags, some are like boxes, but I even see a portion of land. I see, I see many things that are part of things that the Lord has given to you and, and the enemy has been holding them. But the Lord is saying that they are going to come back to you. Because it's been apportioned to you and you need them for this season. So Father, I thank you right now that all of those things are brought back into the court. Let them be brought back into the court. Not one thing is to be left, God. As far as these people are concerned, as far as these houses are concerned, Father, we ask everything they've repented of, let now those things be brought back. And Father, I'm asking, let them be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Yes, anything added to them, anything Lord. taken away, let them be returned to the original pattern. Yes, Lord. And Father, I'm asking you to begin to release back to your people tonight. Yes, Lord. According to your word, release back to them what they need <coughs> for this season. Lord, many of them are standing at the door of 2018. Lord, they are wanting to press in and go through. But Father, we ask, we ask back for everything they need. Lord, put it back in their hands. There are opportunities and doors, and we even heard tonight keys for some people. Lord, they need them for this season. So Father, I ask for a release of that which has been lost, that which the enemy has held. Let it be released to them tonight. Let it be released to them tonight in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I really encourage you because I know many of you have been in the courts and you've been dealing with your stuff. But you may not have added this part. And I really see the Lord saying, come, come, come to me. Bring, bring me into remembrance of those things you've repented of and ask for them back because I saw stuff coming back. Amen. And for many of you, it's things you need now. Yes. It's things you need now. And I'm not saying it's things, things, like necessarily material things. It's doors that must open. Yes. It's connections that are meant to be made. Relationships, people you were meant to have connected with. Uh, you know, things like that. I really see opportunities that were meant to come to you that never came to you. Okay? And you need to have them now. Mm -hmm. yes. So tonight when you go home, I want to encourage you. Go back through your journals. Look at what you've been doing. And go to the Lord and say, Lord, we won this case. Yes. We got a decree of release here. Mm -hmm. But Lord, yes. we want back. 
We want back what was meant to be ours. We want back. Because the Lord is returning. He is bringing Amen. back. There is Amen. restoration that is coming to us as we begin to do that. Because it's part of what the blood of Jesus won for us. He wants you to be more than overcomers. He wants you to have life abundantly, over the top. Yes. Completely overflowing in every single area. Yes. Not just getting by, not just surviving, not just, you know, bottom of the barrel. You're meant to be on top. You are the head and not the tail. You are the lender and not the borrower. Okay, those are not just words, that's true. It's reality. And he wants to lift you guys into that place. I sense it so strongly. Yes. He wants to lift you. And even as I'm talking, I can I can feel there's this thing of the enemy that wants to press down and say, oh no, it's not like that in your life. Don't get your hopes up. Don't get your... No! That is the lie yes. of the enemy. That's God right. wants to lift you. He <coughs> made you to be above and yes. not below. That's what the scripture yes. says. Yes. You are blessed to be a blessing. Okay? Mm -hmm. That, you know, don't let the lies of the enemy come in and say, well, that's not my experience. God wants to lift you individually, but as a people. And there's something about this upstate area, this area upstate here. God wants to lift you ever upward. God wants to lift you higher in this season. So, Father, I pray that as they go from this place, cause faith to stir on the inside of them. Do not let the enemy steal this from them. But, Lord, you want to take them ever upward, ever higher, from God glory to glory, even as we pray that, from glory to glory, from glory to glory, I want you to understand the word glory does not only mean the manifested presence of God. The first mention of the word glory in scripture has to do with material wealth. The second mention of glory has to do with influence, was Joseph's position. The third mention of glory is only about the manifested presence of God. So when we were singing tonight, we're going from glory to glory, it's manifested wealth, it's influence, and it's the presence of God. It's all of those things. And God wants to lift you from glory to glory. There is something that He wants to come out of this area. That, that is a manifestation of the glory of God in the fullness of what that means. Because people want to say, well, who would ever have thought that that could come out of that area? Would well, you know those people who live up there? Who would ever have thought such a thing? That is what is going to be the testimony because of what God is going to do out of this place. So I want to encourage you guys to go home. Let that stir in you. Let it stir in you, okay? God's doing this thing. So tomorrow, 9 o'clock, we're continuing. So tomorrow, I'm going to do the good stuff. We're going to talk about God's trading floor. Because that for me is so much more exciting. Than the enemy's trading floor. We're going to be talking about God's trading floor. And what does it mean to trade in God's house? What does that look like? That it's part of our priestly job. It's part of our pre priestly role. And, and I tell you it's going to revolution, revolutionize your mind. And your mind. So, I'll see you all in the morning. want to go, but let me just encourage you, if, if what you're hearing tonight is, is, is pretty new, and maybe you haven't been so familiar with the courts and, and things related to that, that you really, what we heard tonight is so profound, uh, and that there's a kind of a rule of thumb that we act on, uh, when we hear a message, we have roughly an hour to an hour and a half to implement that, to activate it. I would really encourage you to go home get in a quiet place and just say, Lord, is there anything I've unintentionally traded that I haven't repented for? Is there anything or I, anything I intentionally have traded for that, Holy Spirit, you're going to show me? Uh, I can tell you from doing, you know, a, a bunch of court things, we all have altars in our life. Just saying. Just give somebody a shot say he's talking about you. So, so we all have them, you know, from Europe to Africa to South America, there are all altars there. That's intentional trading. Unintentional trading is things that we think are going to slide along, but maybe, anyway, let God show you. Just get quiet and say, Lord, I'm open. I don't want anything in my life that I'm trading with on the altars of enemies or on the trading floor of the enemy. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. The second thing is, and I don't, about halfway through, I just felt like 
the worshipers should come up because of the, the, how important worship is. And just come up and just stand up here and just say, Lord, I want my worship to be so pure. You know, if you're a worship leader or a musician, if you could just come up and stand. I, I know we're all worshipers, but I, for whatever reason, this is what I felt the Lord wanted us to do. Just stand and just say, Lord, I want, I, and we'll see where this goes. Just stand across the front, folks, and just... Just begin to just worship and just consecrate yourself. Say, Lord, let there be such a pure sound out of this house, these houses. Let there be such a pure sound out of these regions and out of these churches. Baptize them afresh in the sound of heaven. Drop in their heart the weighty glory of how important what they do is. Let them drink. Let them drink as ASAPs. Let them drink, Lord. As they drink, we pray there was a raising up of the worship in this region. That it would just raise up, that it would take each house, it would take the region to new heights. stand in your place, in your presence at the throne of grace. Lord, we pray a new anointing, a new release, even the keys of David, to take their bodies, their congregations, to the places where you would have them to go. Lord, begin by taking them there personally, and let the overflow show up in their services, we pray. Yes, keys of David. Lord, just drop the keys in their heart. We thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amen, amen. amen. Woo! Alright, folks. 9 o'clock tomorrow. If you have advanced ticket sales,